morning, everybody. I, I see that the room is already quite full. So why don't we follow East Asian standards and start ahead of time? <laughs> You're going to be more punctual than the Swiss. <laughs> Uh, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the panel discussion on the prospects for an East Asian community. I think even by Davos standards, we have a truly distinguished panel. But our challenge, of course, is that when you have such a distinguished panel, how do we hear all of them and hear all of your views in 60 minutes? <laughs> and so, each participant has kind, each panelist has kindly agreed to speak for three minutes in the opening remarks. <laughs> now let me begin perhaps by explaining why today's question is an extremely important one. Many Western analysts have said, and I quote, Europe's past is Asia's future. Just as Europe became convulsed with war and conflict when their new great powers rose, the conventional wisdom holds that East Asia too will be convulsed with conflicts as all the new great powers are emerging in Asia today. <clears throat> Yet, so far, touch wood, the exact opposite is happening. The guns are silent, trade is flourishing, and there are many incipient signs that a real East Asian community is emerging. Therefore, the big question that this panel has to address is the following one. Why is East Asia defying the logic of history by moving towards community rather than conflict. And as I mentioned earlier, each panelist will unfortunately have three minutes only to answer this big question. I know that many of them will agree on some of the big points. So to avoid the panelists repeating the same points, I thought I would pose specific questions to each panelist, beginning first with the prime ministers of Thailand and Vietnam and then we will go uh, alphabetically according to the country's name. So let me begin, Prime Minister Abhisit Vajajit. Period, as you know, Prime Minister. So the question I have for you is, what lessons did Thailand learn about the difficulties and challenges of producing an East Asian community? Prime Minister, the floor is yours. First of all, just to give a short answer to the bigger question that you posed, which is why the region is now appearing to be cooperating rather than uh, entering into conflict. And a simple answer is, to that is, it is in all of our interest to cooperate and to really build on the potential that the region has uh, economically, and also to also realize our potential in terms of contributions to global issues. Now. Turning to our experience as chair of ASEAN and also on the challenges about the building of a, an East Asia community, I think my basic point is that the, the biggest difficulty and challenge has been that people perceive the idea of an East Asia community by referring to the EU benchmark. So they expect some kind of structures, they expect uh, the kind of integration that you have witnessed in Europe. And they appear to be unsatisfied with the current structure of, or architecture of cooperation in East Asia. What I would point out, first of all, is that there is um, a difference between the situation in, in Asia and the way the architecture of cooperation has evolved when you compare to the European experience. So you see, for instance, that as, as far as ASEAN is concerned, and we would like to maintain ASEAN centrality in the East Asia cooperative architecture, uh, we began as a grouping that focused on security, not even on the economic cooperation when we started. And the region was actually still at war. And we only had about five, six members at the start. And we were able to expand that to include all 10 Southeast Asian nations. 
and then at the same time begin to work with our dialogue partners where there is huge diversity, not just in, in the form of uh, economic development stages, but also political systems. So uh, I think that has to be taken to, into account when people try to compare what we're doing there with what, we are, with, with what the European Union has achieved. But I can certainly tell you that during our chairmanship, during the East Asia Summit and the ASEAN Plus Three uh, Summit, uh, it was clear that we were all determined to make sure that the architecture continues to evolve. And uh, we take as a, as a good starting point that ASEAN has now a, a new charter. It is becoming a rules-based organization. It is moving towards a single community in 2015. <coughs> it already has free trade agreements with Japan, with Korea, with India, with Australia, with New Zealand, with China. So the next logical step is to have some kind of free trade area, uh, including all these members. It has already accepted the proposals made by the Prime Ministers of Japan and the Prime Minister of Australia about the need to have this evolving architecture that is more inclusive, maybe even across the Pacific. <coughs> Except that, of course, we want to see this as an evolutionary process rather than quickly defining the membership, quickly defining the structure. And what is more, we have also achieved some of the substance in terms of cooperation that we wish to see. I mentioned the free trade area already, but last year, and actually, uh, as of now, we're about uh, to put the final touches to what we call the Chiang Mai Initiative <coughs> Multilateralization. So it's actually a regional reserve pooling swap arrangements that is in place. I think that demonstrates that we are ready for, for uh, an evolving cooperative architecture that will serve our people. So uh, just to end, people often ask when we are going to be like the EU. My reply has always been, we'll address the concerns of our people we will be cooperating, we will be building a community, almost like the EU. The one thing we don't want is the level of the bureaucracy that we see in the EU. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Prime Minister. That was a great start. And thank you very much for speaking in your allotted time of three minutes. You set a very good example for the other panelists. <laughs> uh, before I ask the Prime Minister of Vietnam the question, I'm going to encourage you all to put on your headsets, because I believe the Prime Minister is going to be speaking uh, in Vietnamese. So uh, I'll pose the question to him and the Prime Minister will reply. Prime Minister, Vietnam is the current chair of ASEAN and indeed as the Prime Minister of Thailand said earlier, ASEAN has played a very central role uh, in the creation of an East Asian community and he also mentioned some of the future steps that might be envisaged as we go ahead. So now that Vietnam is taking over the chair, what are your plans in terms of pushing forward an East Asian community? Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, I think that uh, an East Asian community of peace, stability, friendship, cooperation, is uh, taking shape in practice. Um, regional uh, cooperation uh, and um, with the uh, mechanisms like ASEAN Plus Three, as uh, Prime Minister Abhishek said, or the EAS, or ASEAN Plus One, and RRF, we have. Uh, uh, such me mechanisms in place which are moving effectively forward, contributing to the shaping of the East Asian community. I think that uh, ASEAN and in a peace, ASEAN of peace, stability, friendship, and well-connected and dynamic the development will be a very important element towards the uh, shipping of the East Asian community. And as such, Vietnam welcome all initiatives and uh, advisors from any one from either the Prime Minister of Australia or the, the Prime Minister of Japan to build a community in East Asia or in the Asia Pacific. 
because we really want to have a community of peace, cooperation and development and prosperity. Yet, any new mechanism, any new community should be complementary to each other, complementary to the existing ones. They should not dominate the existing ones. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister. Again, I thank you for sticking to the time that was allotted and for mentioning that there are actually many proposals for an East Asian community that are emerging, Japan's, Australians, and therefore this is a natural segue to you, Simon. <laughs> Uh, as you know, the Australian Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, has floated new ideas for strengthening the East Asian community, yet I'm not giving any secret away, there's been some resistance uh, to his ideas. How do you think Australia's ideas will play with the other ideas that are emerging on the East Asian community? I think, first of all, they've been the important catalyst to get the important thinking about what sort of structure is needed going forward. And I think we start from the very strong position that already there are st strong structures within the region. And in many senses what we're talking about in challenging the way forward is that we do need to look forward in the way the um, Prime Minister of Thailand has indicated because the, the region is evolving and the global financial crisis has turned much on its head. We've seen a lot of things that haven't worked and we're in a position to really learn the lessons and build uh, constructively. And I think that the more important dimension is that whilst we have very strong structures within the region, uh, there is the capacity, we do need a capacity to broaden the mandate. Whether one does that, does that by building on existing structures or whether we need to find a new one remains to be seen. The debate is out there. But can I say that regardless of the continuing debate with that, the great thing that has happened in the last uh, couple of years has been the strengthening economic relationship. And bear in mind the free trade agreements that were talked about, the six of them essentially, ASEAN plus sixes, all occurred and were signed post the stalling of Doha. And this was a significant breakthrough. The Australia-New Zealand uh, Free Trade Agreement is an agreement of a grouping of countries, the 10 countries, 600 million people, and the two-way trade with those countries between us is bigger than China. This is the magnitude of it. Now, the interesting thing in terms of the conclusion of that Free Trade Agreement was that we didn't finalise it in traditional trade terms, just trade liberalisation. We understood the fundamental importance of having to address capacity building. This was an important aspect of clinching the deal. And now I think that set the pattern for where the bilateral agreements head. A realisation that if we're to advance development within the region, it isn't just trade liberalisation, it's building the capacity of developing countries to participate more effectively and competitively in that exercise. So I see this as a great dynamic. The next dynamic was what came out of Thailand's chairmanship of, um, uh, of the ASEAN um, uh, summits, that if the logic is that ASEAN has been able to sign agreements with six others, the next, best, the next logical thing is to try and get the integration in the region and we've got a parallel process going that seeks to achieve it. Interestingly, those agreements are all headed in the direction of not just access at the border, addressing issues behind the border, and now with the big agenda that Singapore has put on the table in APEC, logistics in the region. If we can get the logistics flowing as a no border concept, there will be significant new efficiencies. So I think the ongoing drive for what's going to emerge as the new architecture is going to be built heavily on what we do on the economic integration, and that is proceeding at a very considerable pace.
Thank you. Thank you. And I'm glad you highlighted the economic dimension because what's amazing in East Asia is how trade and economic integration is even flowing faster than the agreements that have been signed. And that's quite something quite remarkable. So from Australia, it's a natural move to Indonesia, uh, to Minister <laughs> Mari Pangestu. Mari, as you know, Indonesia has been the traditional anchor mm. uh, of ASEAN-led cooperation. But now Indonesia has also a very vigorous democracy, a civil society, a media, and we have lots of new Indonesian voices clamoring to be heard on the creation of these communities. How do you see the role of these new voices it was in, in, in the path towards creating an East Asian community? Uh, well, let me try to make three points in three minutes. Uh, the first point is uh, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> obviously, uh, in, how, how is Indonesia viewing its role uh, in the ASEAN region as well as in the wider East Asia region? Uh, the way we think about it is that it has to be couched even in the bigger picture uh, of the growing role of Asia uh, in the uh, global order. As we know, a lot of the discussions even here in Davos is about the center of gravity shif shifting to Asia and how Asia needs to play a bigger role, uh, including in the international governance. So Indonesia is a member of, uh, is the only ASEAN member who is a member of G20. Uh, there are six countries uh, in uh, East Asia uh, which are members of G20. So the question uh, out there is, uh, what role should Asia play uh, in uh, shaping the global governance, uh, whether it's reforms of IMF, the World Bank, and how to uh, invigorate or <laughs> conclude the stalled Doha negotiations. These are the three big items, even, even climate change you could put in there. Uh, I think the answer for, from an Indonesian perspective is to answer that uh, we, we, we cannot expect one or two of the uh, big Asian members to be the one playing the role. It should be the East Asia uh, as a region uh, to play a role uh, in the G20. And therefore, uh, my second point is, how do we strengthen the regional architecture so that we can play uh, a more responsible and responsive role and contributive role in shaping the global order? So when you ask the second question is, what kind of regional architecture uh, should uh, develop uh, in the region? Uh, uh, we, we always talk about ASEAN, Indonesia being the uh, largest country in, in ASEAN. Obviously, you start with ASEAN, how we must uh, continue, accelerate uh, uh, progress in shaping the ASEAN economic community, while at the same time, in parallel, you know, we have a lot of debate about the centrality of ASEAN first before you do other things. But I think we, we've gone beyond that now. Uh, centrality of ASEAN, yes. But at the same time, in parallel, as Simon just mentioned, we already have FTAs, uh, some more comprehensive than others, with all the six uh, East Asia uh, dialogue partners. Uh, and then we get into a debate, is it uh, uh, CHAFTA or IAFTA? Uh, East Asia FTA, uh, ASEAN plus three, or is it uh, CHAFTA? Is it, I always forget the acronym, partnership, uh, partnership uh, Asian community of ASEAN, a comprehensive uh, uh, East Asia partnership, which is ASEAN plus six. I think uh, rather than get into a debate which one is better, uh, I, I would like to follow on uh, Prime Minister Abhisit's point. Evolution, you know, it's building blocks. We, we, we should all build it in, in parallel, and they're all actually uh, build, uh, shape, building on each other. Uh, and they are, as you said yourself, economic integration happens, trade and investment happens, in spite or despite uh, of these arrangements, but these arrangements should make it happen faster and, and better uh, and in a more com comprehensive way and shape the way our region should be then contributing to the wider role. Uh, and the, the third point I would make is then uh, we have then the, the usual questions we ask. Uh, if, if it's ASEAN plus three or ASEAN plus six, uh, there's also a trilateral uh, summit between Japan, China, and Korea. There, the, there's two big questions out there that we always talk about when we talk about uh, the variable geometry in regional architecture. Uh, leadership role between Japan and China, and how to include the US uh, in the dialogue, so the trans-Pacific uh, angle. And here, I would just throw it to the floor. You know, How do we deal with this? 
uh, Korea will be the chair of G20, uh, so that that's a good opportunity. Uh, in in the I'm no longer an academic, but from uh, what I hear from the academic circles, there are three proposals uh, out there. Uh, one is to have uh, Asia Pacific community, uh, a la what Kevin Rudd is proposing, uh, and then you would have uh, in the a APEC summit you would have a subgroup of leaders uh, li linked to the uh, G20, linked to the global uh, order. The second idea is uh, East Asia Summit plus plus. You would invite uh, uh, Russia, uh, in US to the table after you have the East Asia Summit of leaders. The third idea is G20. So you would have a subgroup of the Asia Pacific economies uh, meet at the same time as the G20. So I think maybe all three could happen. Uh, th these are all ways of how uh, East Asia must and should play a bigger role in shaping the regional architecture. It's the time. But how do we do it? It means we must strengthen the regional architecture, and we must ensure that the trans-Pacific component is there. Thank you. Mm, thank, thank you. I must say that's a very comprehensive um, view, re review of all the proposals that are on the table. <laughs> uh, from Indonesia, actually, we're going to go to Japan. And again, I encourage you all to put your um, headsets on, because the, I believe the Minister Naoshima will be speaking in Japanese. And Minister Naoshima, I hope you don't mind if I ask you a difficult question. Um, as you know, one of the most potentially difficult fault lines, geopolitical fault lines uh, in East Asia is the one between Japan and China. And, and many of the skeptics about East Asian community always emphasize how can Japan and China get along. And yet, if you look at it objectively, relations within Japan and China have never been better. And, and there's a very strong sense of community even developing within Japan and China. So how do you think Japan and China are working together in terms of creating a stronger East Asian community? Thank you for that very difficult question. Uh, we consider that further developing relations between Japan and China will uh, result uh, in a stronger partnership in the East Asian region. And obviously, although you, don't, you did not touch upon this, uh, Japan-U.S. relations is uh, at the very fundament fundamental level uh, in doing so. Uh, so uh, Japan-China and also China-U.S. relations as well. Relations between these countries need to be developed uh, uh, for the uh, stability and development of the Asian region. Prime Minister Hatoyama and the Hatoyama government is advocating the creation of a East Asia Community Initiative as a long-term policy. And as was mentioned, uh, the countries of Asia and the Pacific need to work together uh, and develop together, and this will be for the sake of the common interest, and I believe the countries of East Asia has learned this over these past uh, 10 some years. Uh, currently, Asia, as the growth center of the world, is uh, really leading the world economy. And Japan, at the end of last year, uh, has announced our new growth strategy. Uh, Japan uh, intends uh, to make a great contribution to the uh, development and growth of Asia. Uh, and uh, by doing so, Japan itself would also uh, like to grow itself, particularly uh, in terms of economic relations, as was mentioned by other speakers. Uh, we have already uh, had the conclusion of all the ASEAN plus six economic partnership agree uh, uh, arrangements, and currently economic partnership agreements of a more uh, wider sub-regional basis of ASEAN plus three and ASEAN plus six uh, is being discussed. And also, uh, the uh, joint study among industry, uh, government, and academia of uh, China, Korea, and Japan FDA is also uh, begun preparations. Uh, so going forward, uh, we wish to develop a roadmap for the creation of a free trade area of the Asia Pacific, uh, since we will be in the chair of the APEC next, uh, excuse me, this year. And also, the greatest uh, dimension of enjoying uh, sub-regional 
uh, development in this area is to make sure uh, to develop uh, infrastructure going beyond national boundaries. And I think this is what will make certain uh, economic development in the entire Asia region. Uh, so as we have discussions on economic partnership with other regions, these various initiatives for infrastructure development have been emerging. And we now have underway uh, the Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor Initiative with India. Uh, and we have the japan Mekon Economic and Industrial Cooperation Initiative. And we also uh, have with Indonesia, the Indonesia Economic Corridor Initiative, on which we have agreed to cooperate between Japan and Indonesia. Uh, so in the Asian region, we have been announcing uh, these various infrastructure initiatives one after another, and Vietnam also uh, has their own initiative. Uh, so. Uh, Japan, as I mentioned earlier, in addition to promoting economic integration, we also uh, wish to uh, make a contribution to infrastructure development in the wider Asian region. And by doing so, the economic development of the Asian regions, I am sure, uh, will make major leaps in its development and growth. And one last point I would like to mention is when we consider uh, further economic development in the future, uh, the issue of climate change is a very important issue. Prime Minister Hatoyama predicated on the creation of a fair and effective international framework with the participation of all major countries and agreement on an ambitious targets, Prime Minister Hatoyama has announced an ambitious target of a 25 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2020 if compared to 1990 levels. We are now in the midst of working on a global framework for climate change. And as you know, Japan has the lowest CO2 emissions per unit of GDP among the developed countries. And we have the most advanced uh, environmental technology, energy efficiency technology, and also nuclear power generation technology with a high level of safety. Uh, so including these technologies uh, and using these technologies, among others, we intend uh, to make a contribution to the growth of the Asian region. Uh, so uh, working on for the growth and climate change, these two pillars are uh, two very major agenda issues uh, that we intend to work on uh, for further growth in the future. This year, Japan will be in the chair of APEC. Uh, we wish to carry on uh, the achievements made uh, last year in Singapore and work with Singapore, last year's APEC chair, and also US, uh, next year's APEC chair, uh, to have our two countries work together and to carry on the work done by Singapore uh, to present some important growth strategy proposals for Asia Pacific this year as the chair of APEC. Thank you very much. I, I want to apologize to Minister Naoshima for interrupting him, but uh, I'm trying to get all the panelists to stick to three minutes. And I'm glad you, you, may, you raised many new dimensions, uh, infrastructure, climate change as elements also as part of the uh, regional cooperation. And I want to mention, by the way, that I noticed already in the audience some questions emerging. Charles Grant has carried out a British preemptive strike and raised his hand to be the first questioner. <laughs> but so get ready your questions. Uh, and now, because we still have to listen to uh, two more, I believe, panelists. From Japan, we go to Korea. Uh, Minister An Ho Yang, as several people have mentioned, uh, Korea will host the next G20 meeting. And we know that the G20 focuses on uh, global and not regional challenges. But, but you see the G20 meeting, especially with uh, President Obama coming back to Asia again, as an opportunity to reassure the United States that they should not be worried about all these proposals for an East Asian community. The United States should not feel excluded from all of this. What's your view on that? Thank you, Kisho. Well, if there is one thing we should be saying about Asian leaders, it's this, which is that I've been listening to uh, all, my, all the leaders very carefully, and then they are talking about uh, today, they are talking about tomorrow. None of them were talking about yesterday. And then I think you must say something about Asian leaders in the sense that they are forward-looking. That may explain why there is emerging East Asia community. But at the same time, let us just try to step back a little bit and then think about why all these uh, <coughs> ideas about East Asia community is emerging. And then in my mind, there is one simple 
uh, mathematical formula which can, can explain the phenomenon, which is culture minus ideology plus economy. And then what I mean by that would be obvious to you in the sense that with respect to culture, then of course there have been very high degree of uh, cultural identity or cultural similarity among the old East Asian countries. And then the reason why that cultural identity did not lead to emergence of East Asia community earlier in my mind is because of ideological division of both the, the countries, especially after World War II. But at the same time, it is dissipating. Ideological confrontation is dissipating. And one good example would be the relations between Korea and China in the sense that we established our diplomatic relations, don't be surprised, only in 1992. It is only 18 years that we have had diplomatic relations with China. So that is about uh, ideological dimension. Let me move on to my last di dimension, which is uh, e economy. And then all of the leaders have been very, very eloquent about what economy has played, what role economy has played in strengthening the relations among East Asian, East Asian countries. And then again, getting back to the bilateral relations between Korea and China, when we established our diploma diplomatic relations in 1992, it was very, very small. The trade volume between the two countries remained very, very small. Today, it has exploded to $180 billion. So that will explain why economy, as they often, as they often say, merchants do not make war, they make peace. And then that would explain why economy, what role economy has played in strengthening the relations among East Asian economies. But at the same time, let me agree with my Asian leaders, Asian colleague leaders, in the sense that what is more important is not the past, but today and tomorrow. And then one key question we should be addressing would be what Kishore has just raised with me, which is that what impact the regional integration will have on international relations at a higher plane, which is global governance questions. Because I think there is, uh, there is widespread view that there is trade-off relationship between regional integration and multilateral or global integration. And then I think it really depends upon the will of the political leaders in the sense that, and then what shape the institutionalization takes, takes place. And then when it comes to that, I was just listening to my fellow leaders and then they're talking about uh, trade, they're talking about climate change. And then when it comes to DDA, when it comes to climate change negotiation under the UNFCCC, as well as when it comes to G20, then what we see is something they call global sclerosis. That's an expression which has been, which has been developed by David Brooks in the sense that where well, there are so many important issues like DDA, current is there, and climate change, et cetera, et cetera. And then we know where, where the global interests lie. But at the same time, the reason why we cannot just uh, tie all the notes and then come up to the conclusion is because of parochial interests. And then I was just looking at the, this thesis of global sclerosis. And, and then what, what I truly think is this, which is that I look upon Asian leaders, and then I was just wondering if they get together and then try to ask themselves what really is in their national interests, whether it is trade, whether it is climate change, then I think they can get over the technical details and then, and then come to a very positive outcome in, the, in all those negotiations. One, one last point, which is, has already been addressed by uh, Mari Pangestu of Indonesia, which is that in the early days of APEC, then what I remember is that the APEC, the idea of APEC had to compete with the idea of East Asia caucus. And then the, and then the position, position Korea took at the time was that, uh, well, uh, it may be a far better idea to have a trans-Pacific relationship rather than East Asian relationship alone. And then I think that would remain as a, as a very, very valid thesis even today as we approach all these issues. That is to say, emergence of East Asia community, emergence of uh, East Asia as, uh, as a solid identity among G20, et cetera, et cetera. We should be thinking about uh, this uh, trade-off relationship in regionalization and then global integration and then try to come up with a firm view on what must come first, which in my view should be global architecture rather than regional architecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've raised this discussion to an even higher level now. <laughs> We're going to solve the problems not just of Asia but of the world. <laughs> uh, last but not least, <laughs> that's my question, yes. Minister Giorgio, you've heard all the comments. Uh, Singapore has always tried to play a helpful role by trying to harmonize the different points of view. But as we all know, the one major country that's missing in this panel is China. And we all know that China, will, of course, will have an important role to play. So I was going to ask Minister Giorgio whether you could try and 
anticipate, if possible, what you think China's reactions might be to the discussion <laughs> so far. <laughs> You know this, I give the most difficult question to the Singapore minister. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Shaw, my fellow Singaporean. <laughs> no, I, I'm not in a position to speak for China. I have a view on China, obviously, but uh, China is China. And if you look at the cycles of Chinese history, uh, they are long cycles. Uh, every time it's on the ascent, it brought trade, it brought prosperity to Southeast Asia. So Tang Dynasty with Sri Vijaya, uh, Yuan Song. Huge trade between Southeast Asia and China. And during Ming, Malacca flourished. And that trade went all the way to the Indian Ocean. So I like uh, Minister Ang's little formula about uh, culture minus ideology plus, plus economics, uh, defining the age we live in. And I think, in, indeed, that's the case. All of us want connectivity. We want porosity. We want options. We don't like community with a capital C. We want it small C, soft. And we want as many as possible. So we carry many plastics in our wallet. I mean, you check, each of us check our contact list on our handphone. We don't want to be restricted just to our own country. We want options. And sometimes, as many clubs as possible. And please don't deny, don't be exclusive. We, take, we should take a more relaxed view and leave the specialists to do quizzes on what country is in this organization and not in the other organization. And most of us will fail anyway, unless you are a senior official responsible for international organizations. The fact is, there is a larger reality which is pushing us all forward, and we're trying to adjust our position. And for Singapore, it's not just China, but also India and the Middle East, which are growing in importance once again. And they're all different. You take, say, Davos. CII, India, have been involved from the very beginning. And they're very relaxed about it. They don't always coordinate who, who come. Uh, they, 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 they have cocktails and so on. And, and we, we, we join in, we have a nightcap. Then China decided some years ago that it should be part of WEF. And when China comes, it is always and every time an organized effort. And when they decide to give priority, we are suddenly overwhelmed. And each expresses the deep values and habits of ancient civilizations. We in Southeast Asia are in between. And all along the maritime coast, from Japan all the way to the Middle East, there is a continuum of cultures working on the formula which Minister Ang talked about. Culture minus the ideology plus economics, and then whether you're a, a, a monk or an imam or a trader or a <coughs> scholar, you treasure the friendships you make and the connections you make, and you believe in an age now where ideology is subsiding. But mind you, one day you will rise again, but let it be a long time in the future. Let us make as many friends and connections as possible <coughs> and join as many clubs as we can. So, Kisho, I take a bottom up view. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I, as you can see, uh, I must say, even I am sort of surprised by many of the answers you've heard here. We've, we've touched on many new areas that I didn't anticipate would come up uh, in the discussions here. But it sort of illustrates the, the richness of the discussion that is going on uh, in East Asia. Now we turn to the floor. I thought uh, maybe I'll take uh, two or three questions. And then, if, you, if possible, try and be specific in naming the panelists you want to answer so that we don't have seven answering uh, each question. So as I mentioned, Charles Grant raised his hand, and then gentleman over there, and then gentleman over here, take the three first. Charles, please identify yourself and for the panelists, and if you don't mind, a short, sharp, <coughs> brilliant question. <laughs> I'm Charles Grant from the Institute of European Reform in London. Uh, I've heard a lot of self-satisfaction and self-congratulation. Let me try and put a bit of uh, grit into this discussion. Um, two worries I have about what I've heard. Firstly, um, for all these wonderful organizations being set up, none of them involve the session of sovereignty like the European Union does, or to some extent like NATO does. None of them is very strong. They're all very weak. Are you really so confident that you're going to be entering an era of perpetual peace and prosperity. If so, why are your defence budgets going up all over the region? <laughs> Unlike in Europe where we're cutting defence budgets. It might be wrongly, but we're cutting, cutting, cutting. Secondly, 
Um, is the rise of China uh, and the growth of Chinese military power really something that you shouldn't be worrying about? Um, it seems to me that some countries in ASEAN are uh, saying to China, well, we won't annoy you, we'll do what you want. I've just been in Cambodia. While I was there, the government sent 20 Uyghur dissidents to China because China asked them. <laughs> Other countries in ASEAN are actually very worried. In private, they're not in public, they're extremely worried about the rise of China and China's greater assertiveness in, this, in the South China Sea, the East China Sea, uh, even towards the <coughs> So my, my, I just wonder, would the panelists like to say, are they really so confident that their new structures will succeed in preserving peace, and are they really so relaxed about the rise of China as an assertive and more military power? Yeah. Thank you. I, I must say, you did, you did pose some difficult questions. <laughs> the gentleman over there. Please identify yourself, yes. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Takemoto Naokaza. Uh, I'm a member of the House of Representatives of Japan government. Uh, I'd like to ask, uh, especially to the uh, Minister of Thailand, uh, thank you very much for your uh, very deep uh, thinking opinion. But anyhow, uh, in order to uh, accelerate the friendship between the uh, countries in East Asia, the most important thing <coughs> is to, to stay together, to have a common experience. That's the best way. Uh, uh, some of my uh, friends uh, are now staying in Thailand uh, just for a reason, uh, for two or three years uh, with uh, his wife. So uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, phenomena can be seen uh, everywhere in the uh, uh, East Asian countries. So uh, in order to accelerate these uh, phenomena, it's, uh, the most important thing is to take off the uneasiness, especially in case of your country, Sometimes political uneasiness, it's uh, not so good to, uh, to those people. Therefore, if you take off those uneasiness, political uneasiness, uh, so many people uh, go to Thailand uh, for those kind of purposes. Uh, many years ago, our government uh, planned uh, to do the same thing, uh, send the uh, elder people to uh, uh, I am sorry to, uh, to interrupt yeah, you, but yeah, you mind yeah. asking your okay. question? Yeah. So there, uh, uh, Mr. Naoshima knows that, uh, this project very well. Anyhow, uh, please uh, uh, take off political uneasiness in case of your country. Uh, so that's the best way to accelerate the print. Okay. Thank you. Uh, a gentleman over here and one over here, and then you'll stop and come back to the panel, please. Because you, know, you, you only have 20 minutes left. You want to do another round? Yeah. Ad please identify yourself. Yeah. Yes. My name is Atisha Seke. I'm a president of yeah. Kyoto University. Kyoto. Uh, let me add one sort of possible uh, common you know, challenge that uh, the Asian countries together are uh, working with. That is the, the aging population. The Michael, ha Michael, hide the microphone. No, no. You, you, take, try another one. Yeah. <laughs> Try again. Okay. One possible common challenge that the ASEAN countries together uh, will be coping with is the aging population. I mean, uh, increasing proportion aging of, uh, yeah, increasing proportion of older people. And you know, in Japan, already uh, almost a quarter of total population is now uh, 65 years old and over. And uh, you know, the Korea uh, very rapidly chasing Japanese case, and uh, sooner or later, uh, China will be aging, and eventually, whole Asian country will be aging. So, if you know, Asian country will be able to build up some sort of Asian model of uh, aging society, that will be a good contribution to the rest of the world. So, uh, I maybe may I have a uh, ask uh, uh, Minister An at first because uh, China, uh, excuse me, Japan and Korea together is very now rapidly aging. Uh, to what extent we will be able to, you know, work together to design, you know, Asian model of aging society and to diffuse these model towards uh, the rest of Asian countries and eventually at the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Please, the last question. I didn't, please identify yourself. Uh, thank you. My name is Philip Jennings. I'm the General Secretary of Uni uh, Global Union. My question refers to the evolution in the future architecture of, of the organization that emerges going forward. We 
We have a very a strong organization in the Asian and Pacific region and we are very much engaged around the world in a dialogue with governments and with institutions creating processes of regional integration. My question is, is what thinking is taking place looking forward about how you, how you intend to engage with civil society and to broaden the dialogue not just at a governmental level but to other multi-stakeholders in the region? Thank you. Okay, um, this is going to be tough uh, deciding how the questions are going to be answered. I hope that some of the panelists will volunteer to answer the questions from Charles Grant. But let me start with the easy one first, uh, Minister An Ho Yang, about aging. That will give other panelists more time to think about right. how to respond right. to the. <laughs> See, I'm still a diplomat, you know. <laughs> right, right, Kishore, whether you know it or not, you have been my, my mentor all, all my life. And then I didn't expect this out of my mentor. But, but anyhow, but anyhow. Well, the other day I was, to, I was uh, sharing lunch with, with one of my other mentors of mine, who is Prime Minister Han Sung-soo of South Korea. And then he looked at me in a very serious manner. He really meant it. And then he said, well, Ho Young, one possibility you should be, you should be bracing yourself uh, for is you, there is very high chance that you will uh, live up to your 100th uh, birthday. <laughs> and then what he said was that, well, congratul congratulations, you will be able to live up to 100 years old. <laughs> what he said was that you should be bra bra bracing yourself for the possibility of living up to 100 years. And then, and then I, he didn't have to explain in the sense that as medical science goes, as the level of nu nutrition goes up, as uh, where society evolves, then of course every one of us would have to prepare ourselves for the possibility of living up to 100 years old. So what does it mean? What does aging society mean? I think the question was addressed at the collective level. I mean, how as societies we should be pre preparing for the possibility of aging society. But at the same time, I think we should be preparing it not only at the collective level, but at the, at the level of individual, at the level of household, at the level of uh, corporate societies, at the level of, uh, say, government. And then what we should be doing is to take, take it on as, as a practical possibility that all of us are going to live longer. And then as a government official, then of course uh, we should be looking at uh, from a collective uh, perspective as well. And then there are a large number of things we could be doing, like uh, what we do with the retirement age, and then what we do with the kind of uh, job structure we have in each of our economies, what we do with respect to immigration policy. And then when it comes to all of them, especially when it comes to immigration policy, then we will have to admit that uh, either Japan or Korea is not uh, one of the most open societies in the world. So as a matter of fact, I admit that it is a very serious challenge, but at the same time, we are not short of answers. And then uh, as a matter of fact, because of it in my government, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, what we did was that one year back, we designated one ambassador at large uh, in charge of demography issues. Uh, that is to say, uh, that is to say uh, aging society issues. And then it is a lady, and then what she does is that she's traveling a lot to look at how this issue has been handled, handled in developed economies, how this issue has been looked into by such in, uh, institutions like OECD. So we are conscious of the problem at the collective level, at the society level, at the government level, but at the same time, all these collective efforts would have to be complemented by what we do as individuals, what we do at the level of household. And then we have uh, Chairman Sokne Choi, of uh, one of the bi biggest uh, business corporations in Korea, at the corporate level as well. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Prime Minister, you, I think you have a specific question that the member of the House of asked you. And you want to, if you feel, please feel free to touch on, touch on the other difficult questions too. <laughs> okay. um, first of all, the, uh, you mentioned the political instability or political challenges. Um, there's one general point that needs to be made. I think uh, the countries in Asia are in different stages of democratization. And democratization is a process that is rarely smooth. So we have ups and downs, and we have to meet the challenges that come with, with the democratization. And uh, I think what's important is, is that we uh, keep our heads clear about where we, want to, where we want to go concerning political development. And uh, we believe in more openness and, and liberalization. And uh, along the way, we may face some uh, difficult periods where perhaps the exercise of rights uh, often lead to uh, divisions and, and conflicts. But uh, our determination is, is to, to make sure that democratization continues and we are able to preserve uh, order 
And at the same time, we don't lose sight of our economic agenda. And I think despite the uh, political problems and troubles in not just in Thailand, but other places in Asia, we have seen a remarkable continuity of economic development. And I think that should be an, an encouraging sign. I might as well address the issue of civil society. I think, again, uh, this is something that we clearly want to uh, uh, engage uh, in. And uh, in the ASEAN community building process, we have put emphasis on the idea that the community should be people-oriented so that uh, civil society is involved. Over the last year, during my chairmanship, we allow representatives of civil society to meet with the ASEAN leaders, although the process is still not smooth. Uh, and something that we will continue to work on in ASEAN, uh, we clearly recognize the importance of civil society. Um, I'll just make a, a, a couple of points uh, on, the, on the issue of whether we are <coughs> talking about organizations that appear to be weak in form. <coughs> Yesterday, we had a, a very good session among the uh, world economic leaders at an informal gathering. And one thing that came out that was very interesting was that if you look back at last year, in rising up to global challenges, in the end, people felt that G20 was a primary forum where policy was coordinated and helped push along the recovery process. Now, it wasn't pre-designed that the G20 would be that forum, would do that work. But somehow, the informality and the sort of evolutionary process made it work. On the contrary, you had the UNFCCC process, very well defined, mm -hmm. with all the structures, <coughs> tackling the climate change. And it failed. It failed because of the lack of flexibility, the inability to actually translate political will into concrete agreements. My argument is maybe in the future, we're not going to look at some very tidy structure, very well designed in advance, but perhaps more informal evolutionary process that will actually rise up to the challenges of the day and solve the problems for the region or even on a global um, scale. So let me just add that uh, a, a couple more points uh, on that. First, um, the East Asian evolution in terms of uh, architecture is not only meaningful for the region, but for the issue of global rebalancing as well. Uh, the, eco the economy is at the forefront. We need to build a strong Asian market because we can no longer rely on a model of global growth based on the US being the consumer of last resort. It hasn't worked. It has led to this crisis. And therefore, we need to, to, to build a strong uh, domestic or local or regional economy, if you like, in Asia. Having said that, I will end by saying that it is not the objective of the East Asian countries to build a trade bloc. We want to practice open regionalism, which means more connectivities, more connections with partners across the Pacific and also the European countries. And I'll, I'll, I'll end by telling a, a story about how we already practice uh, open regionalism. In Hua Hin, we were having this dinner for, for our leaders during the East Asia Summit. And Prime Minister Rudd, in his usual joking way, walked up to my chair, slapped me on the back, held up his, his glass of wine, and complained. He said, this is an Australian wine. This is Chilean wine. Since when has Chile become part of the ASEAN plus six? And I turned around and I said, Kevin, this is open regionalism, mate. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, Prime, uh, Prime Minister. Uh, I'd like to uh, discuss the questions by, uh, posed by you. I think that Vietnam, the development the rapid development and dynamic, uh, the dynamic development of China will provide us a new um, favorability, a new conditions to the development of the region and the world at large, and also contribute to the development of East Asia. It will uh, put a very 
important contribution to regional development, but it also poses new challenges to development in this region because we have new competitions for development. We have to strive more to make more efforts to compete with China. This is uh, a reality. We also believe that in practice, due to historical reasons, Asia will is also uh, having some uh, territorial uh, disputes, like you said. The settlement of such disputes, in, in settling such disputes, we have no other way but to respect, respect the, international, the principles of international law, the Charter of the United Nations, respect the um, UN Convention on the Law of the Seas, and between China and ASEAN, we have uh, reached a very important document, that is the uh, Code of Conduct, the Declaration on the Code of Conduct of the Parties Concerned, with which underlined the joint settlement of all disputes by peaceful means to find out a solution, a long-term solution uh, agreeable to all the parties concerned. We would not use force or threat of use of force to settle the disputes. ASEAN and China have already uh, reach the DOC, this is a real progress to settle such historical disputes. This is a challenge to uh, regional countries that we need to overcome in order to have an, an East Asian community of peace, stability, friendship, cooperation and development. And I would like to add here that uh, Vietnam as the chair of ASEAN this year, our slogan is towards an ASEAN from action from vision to action. Vietnam will work together with other ASEAN members to make more efforts to implement the ASEAN Charter to turn it into reality and to implement the roadmaps, blueprints for community building. At the same time, Vietnam will work with other ASEAN members to uh, promote the ex enlargement and deepening of the partnership with our dialogue partners on the principles of the EAS to make this an open process, an inclusive process. I fully agree with uh, uh, the Indonesian minister that uh, the EAS, which now includes 10 ASEAN countries and the, its six partners, like uh, China, India, Australia, New Zealand, Republic of Korea, and Japan, we might think of inviting, say, Russia or America into this process. This will provide us with the new uh, elements to build the East Asian community. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Prime Minister, especially for handling the difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> and I was going to ask Minister Giorgio, you, since you retired as a general from the armed forces, would you think you, you want to address the question <laughs> from yeah, Charles Grant on the defense budgets and why they're rising? Well, if, if we can have another generation of peace in the region, then the transformation would be astonishing. So peace requires that there be a balance of pressures and powers. So the Sino-US relationship is perhaps the single most important relationship in the world. Uh, Japan plays an important role in that relationship, and Japan is managing it very carefully. Uh, India is also a rising power in this relationship with America, in this relationship with China. Uh, our relationships should affect all of us in a very important way. ASEAN, 10 small countries each week, 
But our integrity is central to the structure of peace in this century in Asia. Because if we are divided and we become balkanized and we become an arena of power contest by the major powers, then there will be no peace in the region. So for this reason, everybody supports us and integration. And, and that's very good for us. So yes, we talk about community building and so on, but hard power is important and there must be the larger structure of peace in the region. To answer Charles' question, why are we not like Europe? Well, because we have a different history. I mean, Europe, Brussels, it harkens back to Greece and Rome and the Swiss Confederation and Athens and the Holy Roman Empire and Roman law. In our case, our histories are different, different civilizations, different methods of mixing, <coughs> different patterns of trade and exchange. And uh, I think what we must avoid in our efforts at building up links is the search for procrastinate solutions, that somehow we must all be the same and then we judge each other by our own standards. Then that is the surest way to create conflict and very often unnecessary conflict. We have uh, three, four minutes left, I believe. Sure. Can I just take <laughs> you, Maria, and say something? Okay, go ahead. Can I just, uh, although it wasn't addressed to me, the issue about aging society, I think one answer is to have freer movement of skilled labor. Uh, within the region, and uh, we already have the model with the Indonesia-Japan Economic Partnership Agreement, as well as now Philippines, where uh, Japan has given a little window, uh, <laughs> and it, it is specifically for care caregivers and workers. So I think that that's one answer. Uh, and on the civil society, uh, ASEAN is definitely uh, very much engaged with the civil society, and the leaders <coughs> actually have a meeting uh, with the civil society. So I think uh, it's a process, and we do hope that in the bigger East Asia community, it will also be the case. <laughs> Minister from Japan, you want to say a quick word? <coughs> we have to wind up in three minutes. Right. I'll be very short. Uh, the last point I wish to mention to you all here is a point that was also mentioned in one of the questions and also a point that was mentioned uh, in the comments from the panelers. For instance, from the Japanese perspective, uh, Japan-U.S. relations and Japan-China relations is not a, a matter of choice. Uh, it's not a choice that we have uh, in terms of trade, as I have uh, I'm often asked, I'm often asked, are you going to choose ASEAN plus six or ASEAN plus three, or are you going to choose something else? I often receive that question. And the response I always give is, it's not a matter of choice. It's not a matter of choosing one over the other. Uh, but rather, uh, what is important is to create a cooperative relationship in each of those frameworks. Uh, both Japan-US relations and Japan-China relations are the same. The same can be said of these two relations. I mentioned to my American friends that uh, Japan-China uh, Japan-U.S. relations is a fundamental relationship, but at the same time, we need to have uh, the United States develop their relations with China as well. I also tell my Chinese friends the same. You also have to develop relations between China and the United States as well, because that would further uh, promote uh, our efforts to uh, forge uh, and uh, develop relations between Japan and China. The same can be true said of the East Asian Community Initiative. It's not that we will all at once move in uh, one direction to create a certain architecture, uh, but we need to work, first start with working together in terms of trade, start with ASEAN plus three, ASEAN plus six. Uh, we have these two frameworks. And as we uh, really e uh, realize and materialize these uh, respective uh, economic partnerships. Uh, it would uh, eventually develop into an economic partnership for the entire Asia-Pacific region uh, and develop uh, eventually into an East Asian community. I think that is the perspective from which we should uh, understand the East Asian community. Also, a few years ago, I asked uh, a high-level Chinese official, uh, and the question was, uh, I asked the question in the context of growing uh, de uh, defense uh, budget uh, of China. And I asked China, why are you working so hard for high economic growth? And his response was mainly two points. One, uh, so that uh, the 1.3 billion population can uh, lead a, a more better life. And two, 
in promoting economic development, they want to create a mutually uh, complementary and interdependent inter, uh, relationship with Japan and other countries uh, so that uh, disputes would not be settled by force, uh, but uh, disputes and uh, problems uh, will be able to be resolved through cooperation and partnership. Uh, and I think the same can be true of our relations with all countries. And I really would like to trust uh, the re response uh, that was given me by this Chinese official. Thank you. Simon, you got anything to say in 30 seconds or less? Uh, Literally no, 30 seconds. We've, Mari and I have got to go to this trade ministers. And if I happen to be one of those that lives to 100, I hope we're still <laughs> not trying to conclude the Doha round then. <laughs> By the way, before, before normally, normally when the uh, chairman concludes the remarks, he's supposed to say something very har <coughs> harmonious, moderate, uh, reasonable. Let me, why don't I end on a provocative note <laughs> and say that in Davos, we hear lots of Western conversations about the state of the world and they give us many good insights into how the West views global developments, regional developments. Yeah, you've had a very rich non-Western conversation where I think you've heard very different perspectives on how the world should be managed and how the region should be managed. And I hope in that sense, I, I hope you'll agree with me that we should all thank the panelists for giving us some interesting new insights into the world order. Thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, no, sure. Sometimes they're on the seat, sometimes they're outside. <laughs> <laughs>